Hey there, beautiful people. Welcome to this week's edition of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. This is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And if you've been listening to the past episodes, you know that we have been revisiting some of the words of our political ancestors, namely former governors and their inaugural speeches. And thank you to everyone who hung in there with Mm. our last governor, (laughs) uh, Holbrook, who we didn't know was a Brattleboro boy, but boy, that Civil War material was fascinating. But I think, Emily, you would agree, was was this crazy combination of fast, fascinating and tedious. long and tedious. tedious. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, for those who are just joining us, thank you, regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, for being with me this week. We are going to hear today from Governor John E. Weeks who was born in Vermont in 1853, uh, died in Vermont in 1949 in Middlebury, served as governor from 1927 to 1931. Uh, He worked in agriculture in his early life and then also held many leadership positions at several banks in Addison County. Uh, Addison County Trust Company, Brandon National Bank, National Bank of Middlebury. I wonder how many of those are still around. I actually don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then he entered public service in 1884 when he became an assistant judge for Addison County. He went on to serve 30 years in the State House between the House and the Senate. He was Vermont's first commissioner of welfare, as well as the first governor elected to two term to a second two year term in Vermont. Uh, and this is all according to the National Governors Association. Of course, we know the flood of 1927. Uh, that's one reason I chose this particular speech is because it's right at, it's after the flood of 1927, but mere months before the crash of uh, the Great Depression, in, which happened in October, the stock market crash of 1929. Um, he is known for helping the state through Fred flood relief, which, um, or flood rebuilding, received $8 million, uh, in flood relief to do that work. And he also uh, had a promise, and I, I believe fulfilled it, to surface 49 miles of road a year on a pay-as-you-go w- method. So many of the paved roads out there are uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Weeks here. He um, also was elected to Congress uh, from Vermont's first congressional district. But Emily, you might find this interesting. He lost that seat when it was abolished through redistricting. Mm. So this is another, uh, we're having another hint of Vermont having more representation at the federal level and then kind of losing it. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was interesting. This speech is from 1929. And it is his inaugural speech. So without further ado, this is the inaugural speech of John E. Weeks, as it appears in the Journal of the Joint Assembly, Biennial Session 1929. And the speech is from January 10th. Members of the General Assembly. As the General Assembly of the State of Vermont, once again convenes in regular session for deliberation upon the Commonwealth's legislative problems. It seems fitting to pause for a moment in retrospective contemplation of the activities of the past administration, an administration which, owing to unforeseen circumstances imposed by the will of the maker, has been fraught with many difficult problems. The disaster which came upon the state created unusual demands. It taxed the resources, the courage, and the faith of our people, and necessitated activities far beyond the regular routine of the customary state administration program. The emergency caused by the devastating flood of November 1927 affected all branches of state activity and placed additional burdens, responsibilities, and demands upon all departments of our state government. That great emergency was met by our people and our government with one common motive, 
a resolve to restore our Commonwealth, so damaged on that eventful November day. And since that time, the common watchword has been progress and rehabilitation. The true Vermont spirit was vividly exemplified by our indomitable courage in a time of adversity, and the faith and valor of Vermonters has turned catastrophe into opportunity. When the legislature adjourned two years ago, it trusted to the administration a program of highway development unique in Vermont state policies. That responsibility was accepted by the administration and the highway department, and the work was undertaken with the aim and purpose of discharging the responsibility and fulfilling the pledge. Gratifying progress resulted in pursuing the 40 mile program during the first year of Endeavor. State departments, while rendering valuable service to the people of Vermont by functioning with efficiency and loyalty. Conditions were fine, excellent in all branches of governmental endeavor, presenting a most encouraging outlook for development and progress. Then, swiftly and ruthlessly, came the flood to terrify our people, to inflict irreparable damages, and to paralyze that progress which had seemed so secure and so prophetic of our future development. The dramatic narrative of how Vermonters dauntlessly bent to the burdensome tasks before them is widely known and has been rehearsed in verse and story in every part of the country. Vermont faced a dire emergency. Our transportation facilities were hopelessly crippled. Hundreds of bridges and mile upon mile of highway were destroyed. The funds at hand were insufficient to cope with the serious situation. Therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution, I, as governor, called the legislature together in an extra session to provide ways and means for reconstruction and to enact laws consistent with the needs of our towns and the state. The special session convened on November 30th, 1927. In an historic meeting on that date, legislative action provided for the rehabilitation of Vermont by the authorization of a bond issue of eight and one half millions of dollars. Eight million being for the restoration of our highway transportation system and 500,000 for the rehabilitation of our state institutions and departments which had suffered heavy damages by the flood. Through sheer force of determination, Vermont energetically accepted the challenge of the elements and in the face of real discouragement, commenced the work of reconstruction. The results represent, to my mind, a notable achievement for our people and our government. Remarkable progress has been attained in the restoration of our highway and bridge system without curtailment of our regular program of hard surface road construction. Many of the scars left by the flood have already been effaced. And today we stand upon the threshold of a new era of state government, state development. We must face that new era with courage and faith. In legislative action, we must be guided by the desire to enact for the good of the, our state and her people, ever keeping in mind the necessity for sane judgment and fearless action. Legislation imposes certain and real duties upon the members of the House and Senate in accordance with our constitutional provisions. In conformity with a custom long established, I submit for your consideration some matters of importance in connection with the work before you at the present session of the General Assembly. We all realize that progress and prosperity cannot be crested by legislative action, but they may be established upon a firm and secure foundation if sound, proper, and progressive laws are enacted. True prosperity must be the outcome of real service the grasping of opportunities when they arise and adapting conditions to a people's needs. We shall prosper agriculturally, for instance, only so far as the farmer takes advantage of the opportunities that have been placed at his command. We shall prosper as a commonwealth only so far as we utilize and employ our capabilities and our initiative in the development of our natural resources. Pernicious and harmful laws are sometimes passed because of lack of proper understanding or because of too hasty consideration. Guard well against such bills as they prove detrimental and may even work irrepar irreparable injury to our state and our people. 
There is legislation to consider affecting such vital activities as agriculture, forestry, state institutions, education taxation, highways, etc. It is my purpose to touch upon some of these topics, offering whatever suggestions I may have as possible aids in your deliberations. In these deliberations, you must at no time fail to assume the ob obligations that are under you. In these deliberations, you must at no time fail to assume the obligations that are undeniably yours. Foster and promulgate such measures that those gratifying results may obtain, which look to the betterment of our state and our people. We should at all times and under all circumstances promote rather than retard progress and prosperity to the end that all the people may enjoy the common blessings that are inseparable from a prudent, economical, and honest administration of their affairs. One of the most commendable virtues in life today is true economy. We face competition in our daily lives as never before. We earn money faster and we spend faster than has any generation which has preceded us. Wise economy is essential in the conduct of state business and in legislative action. If the state is to function for the benefit of her people, we should, however, regard with the greatest attention the real needs of the Commonwealth, making sure that we guard against an unwise application of economy, which might be detrimental to those needs. Agriculture. Agriculture, because of because it is the foundation upon which Vermont prosperity fundamentally rests is of the utmost concern. During the past two considerable, during the past two years, considerable progress has been made in the development of our agricultural resources. Notable among these developments is the work of the Bureau of Markets, which began in January, 1928. Marketing constitutes one of agriculture's paramount problems today. The marketing program to be of lasting value must be developed on a firm foundation and the emphasis must first be placed on what we are going to sell. To this end, the Bureau of Markets has been working and official Vermont grades have been established for the first time on many products. Vermont is cooperating closely with the other New England states on a uniform marketing program and the use of a New England marketing label. My recommendations to the legislature of 1927 included the need of granting the Commissioner of Agriculture authority to maintain a distinct department under his control, to extend the service of cooperative marketing and to enlarge the scope of its activities to the end that the individual farmer may benefit by higher and more satisfactory prices. I commend the work that has been accomplished during the past year by the newly created Bureau of Markets and recommend that this valuable activity be continued and its scope be extended as far as possible. Bovine tuberculosis eradication. The area test of cattle should be continued. In considering an appropriation for this purpose, it should be borne in mind that bovine, bovine tuberculosis is a highly contagious disease spreading constantly and rapidly in infected herds. And the more energetically this work is pushed forward, the less will be the ultimate cost of complete eradication. 50% of our cattle are now under state and federal supervision. The demand is constantly increasing for dairy for daily products produced from tuberculum tested cows. Other states are spending large sums for eradication and are becoming more and more particular as to the health of the cattle they purchase for replacements. Dairying and the raising of surplus dairy cattle is the backbone of our agriculture. And in order to hold our markets for both dairy products and cattle, it is absolutely essential that eradication work be carried forward without hesitation. European corn borer. The recent widespread invasion by the state of the state by the corn borer pest threatens to become a serious menace to the corn growing industry. Nearly every county is affected by the scourge and great diligence should be exercised to check its advance by the adoption of such control measures approved effective in other localities as the corn crop is one of great value to our state. Forestry. The flood of last year has made all the more mindful, mindful of the importance of keeping our mountains and non-agricultural regions productive of forest growth. Forests may not prevent floods during periods of excessive precipitation, but I believe we all agree that they do lessen this danger and prevent the washing away of the valuable topsoil, 
which is so necessary in keeping our state productive. Probably two thirds of the land area of Vermont might be classified as forest land. And if this vast area is to be handed down to future generations in a productive manner, we must now guard against unnecessary forest destruction. I believe the state should continue and increase as far as possible its forest activities, especially along the lines of forest fire prevention, state forest purchase, reforestation, and protection against forest tree diseases and insect attacks. The plantings of seedlings in available tracts shows material increases and this activity promises much for the future development of our timberlands. I recommend that the forestry department be given every support in its endeavor to plant and propagate seedlings and be given encouragement in its worthy efforts to keep pace with the demand made upon it from all sections of the state for suitable seedlings for planting. During the past year, the state has received, through the generosity of ex-Governor Redfield Proctor, a valuable gift of 90 acres of forest land in Granville Gulf. 900. This, hmm? 900 acres. Oh, I'm sorry, 900 acres, thank you, mm -hmm. in Granville Gulf. This tract, extending for the distance of six miles along the Granville Gulf highways, will protect for posterity this beautiful region. With the increase of travel on our highways, there will follow many creations of man to destroy the beauty of our state and, therefore, I recommend that the state take every opportunity to acquire additional tracks, either through gift or by purchase, so that more of our scenic stretches may be permanently preserved. National Forest. The legislature of 19... Olga, can you hear me well enough when I'm over here? I can hear you perfectly, yes. Okay. okay. National Forest, the legislature of 1926, passed an enabling act permitting the federal government to establish a national forest within the state of Vermont. The National Forest Reservation Commission has recently authorized the acquisition by the United States government of a national purchase unit in southern Vermont, comprising 100,000 acres, thus taking advantage of which the legislation which the General Assembly of 1925 enacted with wisdom and foresight. A national forest... Forests located here will make Vermont part of a countrywide movement to preserve, through scientific forestry methods, our magnificent wooded hills and will guarantee reforestry of the lands within the unit in accordance with the economic and advanced forestry practices. Education. Notable progress has been made in the last two years in the matter of modernizing the rural schools of the state. There are approximately 1,050 one-bedroom school buildings in Vermont the great majority of which have been in need of thorough remodeling. At the present time, there are approximately 400 of these schools which have been standardized or made superior. And if these schools which have now been completed are also included, it is safe to assert that the entire task of making the rural schools of the state modern and satisfactory in all essentials has been more than half completed. The importance of this work can hardly be overestimated and its value has been fully demonstrated by the accomplishments already achieved. Every reasonable effort should be made to push the work to completion as rapidly as possible. Most of the towns in the state have been vitally interested and have contributed generously, both from public funds and private contributions toward the promotion of this work. The state, has also aided substantially through two funds, the so-called standardization fund, from which aid is granted on a one-third basis, up to a maximum of $300 for a single school, and the so-called community fund, from which aid is paid on a 50-50 basis, up to a maximum of $100. Both of these funds have proved so stimulating in this valuable work that they should be continued. The community fund of $5,000 annually was voted by the last legislature as an experiment and has been used to match money privately raised for the improvement of rural schools. The experiment has been distinctly successful 
and the call for aid from this fund has far exceeded the possibility of meeting the requests. It should be highly desirable to continue this fund for the next biennium, making the annual appropriation $10,000 instead of $5,000. I have, I have oh, Go ahead. I have always been a strong advocate of adequate rural schools, and I believe the people of Vermont are zealous in their desires to provide for the education of their children. Let us foster the development of our local schools to the end that the children in the rural districts may be given similar advantages to children who are privileged to attend the schools in larger centers. I consider this of the utmost importance as good schools contribute materially to progress and contentment in our rural districts. The program of training teachers for elementary and rural schools has been developing most satisfactorily. For several years, the supply of trained teachers has been adequate, although this statement must be modified by recognizing that candidates who have completed but one year of normal training beyond high school have been and still are granted certificates to teach. Rapid progress has been made within the last biennial period toward a higher standard of training following high school graduation. The unfavorable conditions existing at Castleton after the fire of 1924 due to the necessity of housing students in rented dwellings has been remedied by the completion of the new dormitory authorized by the last General Assembly. The dormitory was put in use at the beginning of the current school year and is proving exceedingly satisfactory. At the present time, the entire student body is accommodated under most favorable conditions, which will doubtless prove more economical and contribute to a greater degree of efficiency in teacher training. I deem it highly important to pursue the present efficient program and to improve the equipment and facilities for the training of teachers to the end, that we may always have the available adequately prepared instructors for rural and elementary schools. Fish and Game. Vermont resources in fish, game, and wildlife represent values that are tremendous, even if considered purely from an economic standpoint. Our annual income, based on actual figures, is now more than $350,000 from fur-bearing animals alone. The food value of fish and game taken annually is priced conservatively at $250,000. Vermont stands without a rival among the states with our diversified scenic beauty of mountain, field, and forest, with our sparkling lakes and clear running streams. Much of this attractive beauty would be lost if the wildlife of field and forest and the fish in our lakes and streams became, became exterminated or seriously depleted. With our improved highways and modern methods of transportation, every lake and straw and every area of marsh and forest land providing game cover is accessible to the 73,000 or more hunters and fishermen who are licensed annually and to the thousands of farm owners, tenants, and minor children who hunt and fish without a license. To preserve this great heritage for ourselves and future generations is a sacred duty and demands the united efforts of all citizens. This department should be encouraged in its work and aid should be extended whenever possible as our fish and game resources represent one of our most important as well as unique assets. Constructive conservation and use without waste should be our policy. State institutions. Our state institutions in general are very satisfactory at the present time. The physical plans, especially by reason of repairs and extensive improvements at the state prison in Windsor and the rehabilitation work at the state hospital in Waterbury necessitated by, by the flood are in most excellent condition. Both the school for the feeble-minded at Brandon and the sanatorium at Pittsford are badly congested. All those who are a menace to society because of mental deficiencies should be committed to the feeble-minded school and persons needing care and treatment especially in incipient cases of tuberculosis, should receive our attention. The colony home idea has proved to be wise and effective. A second colony home has been established for boys since the original venture for girls in Rutland. This relieves in a measure congestion at the school for people minded in Brandon, but increased facilities are needed nevertheless at the Brandon Institution, as well as the Pittsburgh Sanitarium. And I would recommend for your consideration the advisability of meeting the most vital needs of the school at Brandon and the sanatorium at Pittsford so that this valuable work among the unfortunates of our state may go forward without the handicap of inadequate facilities. 
aviation. The rapid progress recently made throughout the world in aviation would appear to require that suitable legislation be adopted for the control and operation of aircraft. What aviation meant to Vermont at the time of the flood is so well known to you all that I not need to comment upon it here. I recommend that this legislature pass suitable laws defining aircraft, fixing suitable rules, regulations, and requirements for the licensing of operators, and making proper provision for the acquiring of airports by cities, villages, towns, or countries within our counties within our state, either through purchase or by exercise of the power of eminent domain. This subject was given thoughtful and careful study by the Aviation Committee of the Vermont State Chamber of Commerce, and the recommendations of this committee are set forth in their report rendered at a meeting held in Rutland on October 16 last. I commend this report to your favorable consideration and recommend legislation along the lines embodied in that said report. Publicity. Fruitful returns have resulted from the efforts of the State Publicity Bureau to give increased publicity to the marked and superior advantages of Vermont as a vacation state and a pleasure land. The growing importance of the tourist business and the increasing activity of other New England states in this direction makes it imperative that Vermont take every advantage of her splendid opportunities for development. I believe that an increased appropriation for publicity will be an investment that will yield commensurate and gratifying returns. Flood control. In an effort to see if it is not possible to prevent a recurrence of such disaster, disasters as resulted from the flood of 1927, as well as those from which the state has suffered in earlier years, there was appointed late last winter an advisory committee of engineers on flood control under the direction of the Public Service Commission. This committee was requested to investigate the possibility of such regulation or control of the flow of water in the streams as might be necessary to prevent damage by floods. The investigation also included a study of the possibilities of power development in connection with the flood control and the regulation of the streams. On this account, certain power companies in the state agreed to pay one half of the expense of the investigation the balance being paid from the emergency flood fund. The findings of the committee, together with their recommendations, are set forth in a report which is now before the legislature, which I trust will be given careful study and consideration by the assembly. The program proposed is a complete plan for the future control of the streams of the state and the development of the entire water power resources in Vermont. It is a long time program to be gradually undertaken as conditions in the future will justify. If this plan can be put into operation, we may expect to see our flood work greatly lessened and the power available in the state materially increased. Five important rivers in whose valleys the greatest devastation occurred have been investigated. It seems advisable to cover the remaining rivers of the state in the same way during the coming year to the end that all rivers of importance in Vermont would be comprehensively investigated. I would therefore suggest a further state appropriation of $5,000 to complete the preliminary investigation provided a like amount will be supplied by the public utility companies. Highways, there's a lot on highways here folks, so bear with me and try to imagine a time in Vermont before the highways so that you can be sitting in the proper context for all of these paragraphs about highways. No one can doubt the necessity for a comprehensive system of adequate highways in any plan looking to the development of Vermont. Good roads help trade and commerce. They help the farmer and the pleasure seeker. They promote and stimulate business. Every citizen of Vermont today recognizes that there is very evident obligation resting upon the state to continue her program of hard service roads construction as represented by some definitive policy, such as the plan adopted at the last session of the legislature. Gratifying results have been obtained during the past two years while operating under the present pay-as-you-go plan. 
In 1927, 47.8 miles of hard surface roads were constructed in accordance with the most modern and approved methods. During the 1920, during 1928, 57.45 miles of such roads have been built. It is a matter of great satisfaction to the people of Vermont that the program adopted at the last legislation session has been exceeded insofar as anticipated mileage is concerned. Even the flood did not force any curtailment of the program of construction as originally scheduled. Impressive. Seized mm -hmm. over the splendid results already obtained, the people of our state apparently desire to step forward in the march of progress. And there is an unmistakable sentiment for a progressive continuance of the hard roads program. I share that sentiment, and I firmly believe that the interests of all Vermonters can best be served by pushing hard roads development to completion as is consistent with sound business economics. Our public policy should be to speed up the program for the construction of hard roads in accordance with the Federal Traffic Survey, which was unanimously approved by the State Highway Board as a 10-year program. It will be remembered that I offered a definite, definite policy for hard road construction in my message to the last legislature. The plan involved certain features of finance and method which were, as far as essentials go, approved by the legislature. I considered the plan feasible, adequate, and progressive. I still consider it so. My own conviction in considering this paramount question of road development is to continue the plan that has proved itself so beneficial and productive of gratifying results and to increase the mileage under that plan as far as our resources and abilities will permit. Therefore, adhering to the principle of the method and plan I first adopted, I suggest as a possible solution of our road problem an expansion of the present plan, which to my mind will meet the needs of the state for the next two years without resorting to bond issues or drastic and complicated schemes of finance. It is not my purpose to submit any hard and fast proposition from which there could be no deviation or to offer calculations which are so precise and inflexible as to allow but one irrefutable answer so far as the aggregate mileage is concerned. My aim rather is to suggest the possibilities which may lie behind an extension of the present program through utilization of the revenues already available to the road fund together with the additional revenue accruing from a one cent increase in the gas tax. Hmm. Your turn. An examination of revenues, actual and estimated, which will be available for our highways from the various sources, such as gas tax and automobile registration fees, together with estimated returns from a one cent increase in gas, gas tax and a conservative estimate of the normal increase in gas sales and registrations indicate that there would be an income sufficient to construct at least 100 miles of hard surface road during the next biennium. This also provides for payment of interest and principal on the flood bonds and does not disturb the appropriations for maintenance and state aid for unselected highways. If, however, the legislature will make provision for meeting the flood bond obligation for the next two years by securing revenues from other sources, we will be able to increase the hard surface mileage to at least 125 miles for the two-year period. I am convinced that the mileage suge suggested would be the minimum which may reasonably be expected under conditions which will, in all likelihood, prevail through the next two years. It represents, to my mind, satisfactory progress in our hard surface road development. It will be noted that a one cent increase in gas tax is contemplated, but no direct tax is required. And the present appropriations for maintenance of our entire road systems in and improvement of our secondary roads are not disturbed. In any plan for hard surface road development, we must also recognize the imperative need of improving our town roads, so vital to an adequate highway system in Vermont. I'm not unmindful of an indisputable demand on the part of many of our people for a more ambitious plan of hard roads development, which has for its aim a completion of our trunk line system with more pronounced vigor and greater rapidity. If the legislature feels that this demand for a program of more rapid progress is one that should be heeded with wisdom, then there are ways of obtaining the desired result. 
Several plans which contemplate bond issues as methods of financing of our hard roads program for the purposes to early completion of the trunk line system have been placed before the people and frankly discussed by the press and the public. Let me say that while I hold to the belief that the present plan for hard roads construction contains features that are, which are more desirable for the standpoint of safe financing and economic soundness, I am, first of all, most deeply concerned over the welfare and the best interests of Vermont and her people. If therefore the legislature deems it advisable to adopt a change of policy in regard to hard roads development, by favoring some plan other than the method which I've advocated, I will give it my wholehearted support, providing the plan contains provisions consistent with sound business principles, sane judgment, and wise economy. I will not oppose any plan which commends itself for adoption for reasons which are for the best interest of all of the people of Vermont. I am convinced that Vermont must face the highway problem just as the state has faced other problems of great magnitude requiring large sums of money. Vermont must face the highway problem with courage, determination, and the spirit of true progress. Flood bonds. The flood of 1927 made it necessary for Vermont to depart from a traditional public policy in regard to bonding the state. And the legislature, in special session, authorized a bond issue of 8500000 to meet the emergency. It was hoped in the first instance that it would not be necessary to utilize the full amount of the issue under the authorization, but the damage to our highways and bridges has been found to be so extensive and the problems of reconstruction so manifold and ramified that the use of the entire issue will be required in addition to the appropriation of 2.6 million made by the national government. It is incumbent upon the legislature to provide means for the next two years for meeting the obligation thus imposed upon the state and to enact measures looking to the retirement of our bonded indebtedness. It is my belief that an emergency obligation such as the recent bond issue should be met by emergency provisions and the retirement achieved by special revenues obtained for that specific purpose without encroachment upon the established revenues of the state. Upon this theory of public policy, I would suggest as possible methods of meeting this emergency, the enactment of such special measures as a small direct sales tax, state tax, excuse me, a small direct state tax, an amusement tax and readjustment of the fees for registration of motor vehicles. In considering the possibility of a direct tax for this purpose, it must be borne in mind that it is not excess of the state tax of 1927, as that tax was authorized for two years only. I offer this suggestion for flood bond retirement for the next biennium with the full understanding that it is only one of many possible methods for handling this problem. It seems to me to possess the merit of being an emergency tax proposition created to provide for emergency expenditures. I believe such a solution is safe from the standpoint of broad public policy. However, in your deliberations, you may be able to discover a more feasible plan. If so, it will have my endorsement. Taxation. Taxation has always been a troublesome and highly debatable subject. It is a proposition of such tremendous magnitude that it is a physical impossibility to effect a satisfactory solution in one legislative session, unless the results of a thorough and intelligent study is available as a basis of procedure. I would, therefore, ask that the present legislature consider this matter and authorize a commission of at least five persons to study the question of taxation from all angles and to report their findings to the General Assembly of 1931. I recommend a reasonable appropriation for that purpose. In this connection, I would say that in June 1928, the Vermont branch of the New England Council passed a resolution with the recommendation that the governor appoint a committee to consider and study the whole question of taxation because of the fact that the flood had materially increased Vermont's problem of raising revenues. It was further suggested that the committee make a report to the legislature in order that the members might be properly advised before new legislation was passed. Acting upon this resolution, I asked the New England Council to appoint a committee from its own membership to conduct the study, and they have made certain observations and recommendations that are embodied in a report which will be placed before you for your consideration. 
Conclusion. You now enter upon your duties as representatives of the free men vote of Vermont. May your record prove as worthy and fruitful as the records of those who have preceded you in the historic assembly. May you also legislate that Vermont will continue rightfully in that position, which means progress and prosperity, not only for ourselves alone, but also as contributors to the progress and prosperity of the country of which we form a part. Vermont is endowed with resources which can contribute to an enlargement of her material, intellectual and spiritual life. Success in no small degree is dependent upon the service rendered by the legislative assemblies. I ask that you take up your tasks with faith in your fellow men, faith in your state, and faith in God. John E. Weeks. Wow. What did you think, Emily? I think that I want to know how many minutes we have to discuss because that would make me feel more available for thinking about all of my thoughts. 15. Thank you. That's helpful for me. Um, so this one felt so different from previous speeches um, in that it felt remarkably like I don't know of an issue in here that is not an issue that I have experienced debate on in that I've not expected, like it was all, it all felt so consistent with sort of the challenges and solutions and rhetoric of um, current day politics. Though mm -hmm. I was quite charmed by this recurring line. However, in your deliberations, you may be able to discover a more feasible plan. If so, it will have my endorsement. Yeah, you don't hear that. <laughs> Such humility. I just love that. I love that. Not like, you know, certainly uh, Governor Scott never says anything like that. And I would prefer him to say things like that more often, but not even like as a dig at the governor, do I love this? I love it because it's such a spirit of governance and not politics mm -hmm. and like problem solving and not ego. I just get to yeah. know really that one. I, I think that really stood out to me, especially when I think he was talking about roads and just saying, you know, here's my thoughts. If you come up with something better, great. But I definitely won't argue with anything that's great for the people of Vermont. I just want us to get the roads done, like mm -hmm. people. Yeah, I loved that. Yeah, yep. I loved often how when he talked about the people of Vermont, it felt very genuine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say, of all the speeches... Now, granted, we are getting closer to our own modern times. Yes. Uh, but this one felt the most current mm -hmm. of many of what we have read so far. And, and and I found it fascinating, the themes of you have flood and, and you know, building back from the flood. You had the themes of... Um, while it was a bovine tuberculosis, it still had that kind of like emergency response pandemic kind of sound to it. Mm -hmm. that and I found it just, fascinating. And also just like farm crisis. Like there's, yes. you know, this year it was the frost, right? Um, mm -hmm. But always the crisis. Um, the forest pieces were exceptional in that that's something that we're still working on, but like, to see that this was like when our first federal, our first national forest tract was um, created is amazing. And mm -hmm. we're still having these exact kind like we just passed a bill that we call 30 by 30. That's like about preserving this same proportion of forest land mm -hmm. hundred years later. So that's incredible. Yep. Yeah. I really appreciated his it really did seem, at least in this speech, like he was thinking about now and the future. Mm -hmm. And his use of prosperity, I don't know if, I, I can't put my finger on it. It's just a gut feeling. It it felt different than when we talk about prosperity or things like affordability now in, mm -hmm. in current legislation. And like I said, I wish I could give you a better answer on that. It just felt different. Um, and the themes of marketing and yes. uh, tourism <laughs> mm -hmm. and having a New England label. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. I know, like still constant conversations, debate every year. Um, Also, the um, pieces about sort of like grading and um, around agriculture, you know, the recent great, the great maple debate of, was that five years ago that we switched to maple grades? Yeah, anyway. we switched them so they sound more like how we describe coffee. Um, yeah, that's five or six years ago, I think. Yeah. Yep. Wild. Um, <laughs> and then the school section, I actually I just like, going to ask you. I'm planning on cutting and pasting that and sending it to like five people. <laughs> that is. I mean, just word for word, some of the pieces of what we struggle with and just incredible to read um, mm-hmm. and to see how long ago, like, you know, there's even um, sort of threads of a debate around adequate and efficient and effective in modern in the schools. Those are all words that we sort of are always grappling with now. Yeah. Um, the community fund, how much is the state's responsibility? How much is the town's responsibility? Right. And, um, yeah, love it. That's that made the Brigham decision not feel as as um I don't want to use the word radical, but it made the Brigham decision not feel like such a new thing mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. Yep. Uh what he talked about with teacher training, I thought was was interesting as well. Yeah. You know, how do we kind of staff up and make sure we have the resources to make sure that these schools are doing what they need to do? Mm-hmm. Um, now, as someone who who serves on um, your committee that focuses on taxes, mm-hmm. what did you how what was your response to his conversation around all the different taxes? Oh, um, I mean, one, I've actually just always wondered about that. Like there there's still a tax on like pleasure, basically. And it's like amusement rides and a few other things. And I've always been like, where did that come from? And why did someone do that? So like, that's fun that I now know. Um, oh. It was to cover the flood relief of 1927. Um, but that he didn't um, over explain himself. He said like, this is a thing we need to do and we need money to pay for it. And so it's the right thing to do. And like, that's as straightforward as it was. It was not mm-hmm. like this tortured circuitous apology. It was just like, right. this is what Vermonters need. And this is what we need to do to get them that. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, that stood out for me as well. Mm-hmm. That there was the this concept that taxes are going to do what, get Vermont what it needs. Yes. Yes. I was also really interested, two other things. One, um, that there was no federal aid for flooding. I'd sort of heard about, I'd heard about that previously, actually, from our state economists, that there was no federal aid in 1927 for the flooding. Um, But I hadn't realized that we had paid for it with a bond. Um, Me either. This whole idea of an emergency tax um, is something that Vermont has used, you know, Mm -hmm. still talks about. So there was something called the Snelling surcharge. that helped us get out of the recession. That's Um, right. And it was a sort of an an extra tax on um, high income earners. Mm -hmm. On high incomes, it's not really on the person, it's on their income. Right. Um, And so that sort of comes up over and over again, like what emergency would it take to do that? What does that mean to have sort of a short-term tax versus a permanent tax? Um, So that was really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are some fees here that we just adjusted this year. It's great. (laughs) Yeah. It's just just a good, I I feel enriched as a legislator from reading this speech. That makes me, that warms my, my little uh, host and producer heart. Uh, (laughs) I'm so glad. I just want to make sure we ground a little bit of context around the highway program because on the one hand, that was in some ways the driest part of the speech for me. And yet, I, I was just trying to imagine what we go through now with mud season in Vermont. Can you imagine if there were no paved roads, what that mud season would look like? No, and it's funny. I am um, I need to drive to Brandon tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And... 
I am like really like full of grouchiness about it because there are no highways between here and there. Yes, there's no but, like the roads road. are paved. Like, what am I grouching about? <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. And they probably have yellow lines down the middle and in on some you know? I don't even know if there are yellow lines the whole way. It is a ridiculous <laughs> place to try to get to from here. But um yeah, it's it's really quite incredible. And I also know that we, you know, we were one of the last states to really fully finish our highway system. Um, yeah. Also the pay go, the pay as you go, that is yeah. something that we still talk about. We like, there's always like all these appropriations conversations about pay go. We don't even say pay as you go anymore. We just say pay go. So for the um, uh, illumination of listeners, can you tell us a little bit like what that looks like in practice? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's instead of, um, like it's bonding for a big right. investment or um, setting aside all the money for something at that point. It's just, you pay for it as the money is available and you do it as the money is available. Pay mm-hmm. is and and what, what are some of the pros and cons of, of that particular method? Um, it can make planning harder um, mm-hmm. because you don't know exactly how much you're going to be able to finish. So you can't really make mm-hmm. promises. And so contracting could be harder sometimes. Mm-hmm. But it also um, means that you're not paying interest. Right. Interesting. And you're okay. staying within budget. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that, Emily. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm just looking at our, our time, and unfortunately, we are out of time. Mm-hmm. But thank you so much, listeners, for being here and and hearing from one of our political ancestors. And thank you, Emily, for for reading this with me. And I will put a link in the show notes to this on on our podcast page to this speech so you can read it for yourself if you want to go back and review anything. And um, and Emily, any thoughts before we head out? No, I'm looking forward to all my cutting and pasting for all my colleagues when I get off air with you, Olga. Thank you for today. You are so welcome. Hey, if Emily want to, if folks want to find out more information about you, how do they do that? Folks should remember when they're getting in touch with me that the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, respectively, and not the station. And if people want to get in touch with me about my views and opinions or anything else, they can find me at emilykornheiser.org. And we want to thank all the underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, for supporting this station and helping us bring this show to you. We also want to thank Brattleboro Community Television for sharing the videos, uh, taking these videos and making them presentable and sharing them with stations around Vermont. We want to thank BCTV for their work there as well. You can find the Montpelier Happy Hour every Friday on W uh, WVEW, as well as rebroadcasted Wednesday morning at 8. You can also find us wherever you find your pro- podcasts and subscribe to us there as well. We shall be back next week. Have a good weekend, everyone. Olga, I have a PS. Oh, you have a PS. PS. I get. What see did I forget? Olga's, I could see from Olga's face and my own feelings that we were both appalled by the section on state institutions. Oh, geez. Um. And we did not talk about it. However, we have done, I believe, multiple episodes here at the Happy Hour on Vermont's eugenics movement. And so I recommend that listeners go there if you want for a full hour deep dive on the horror and terror that was Vermont's institutional system of control. I'm uh, thank you for that PS Emily. I I had read that section and I I think part of me just went <laughs> just shut down. <laughs> so thank you for reminding listeners um about that. Hey folks, take care and uh we'll be back next week. <laughs>